Hello, everyone. It's just now 7 p.m. on Wednesday, October 11th, and I want to welcome you all to the fourth annual UCSB Natural Reserve System Fall Seminar Series. My name is Andrew Brooks. I'm the Reserve Director for the UC Santa Barbara Carpentry and Salt Marsh Reserve, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. I want to encourage everyone to join us each Wednesday night at 7, beginning tonight and for the next five weeks, as we virtually visit one of the UCSB administered, nat administered natural reserves, uh, part of the greater UC natural reserve system, and showcase some of the truly incredible research and other activities taking place there. Uh, before I turn it over to Heather Constable, the Reserve Director for the Sedgwick Reserve, um, to introduce tonight's speakers and featured reserve, I just want to briefly cover a little bit of housekeeping. Um, tonight's presentation will last for approximately 45 to 50 minutes, and we have set aside the remaining 10 to 15 minutes for you all to ask any questions that you might have for Heather or for our two speakers. Um, if you look to the bottom of the screen, I was hoping you would see a little button that said Q&A, but I don't see it. So what that means is uh, I have done something wrong in setting up the webinar. Um, I apologize, but I think we can use the chat feature uh, instead. So if you have questions for Heather or for our two speakers, please type them into the chat and we'll either respond to you in the chat or we'll read your question out um, during the last 10, 15 minutes, and um, that way everybody uh, can hear the question and the response. Uh, by all means, you don't need to wait until the presentations have ended um, to ask your questions. Feel free to type them into the chat there at any time, and as I said, we'll be um, monitoring those questions, so just go ahead and type them in. Um, with all that sorted, I'd like to introduce tonight's host, Dr. Heather Constable, who will give you all a brief introduction to the Sedgwick Reserve and introduce tonight's speakers. So, Heather, take it away. Well, thanks, Andy. I'd like to welcome everybody to the first of a series of talks about the UC California Natural Reserve System and the exciting research that's happening. Since it's the first talk in the series, I wanna give you a little bit of a background about the UC Natural Reserve System. Um, we have reserves and field stations, but why? And the point is to provide a place for researchers to work in the real world, as opposed to a laboratory or a greenhouse. Uh, so we need to observe things in situ, especially ecosystems and earth science processes. Um, this student, Ken Norris, a graduate student in the 1950s, was working with the desert iguana. It's an interesting species that gets really active at over 110 degrees. And so he was observing their behavior and their diet and their communities over a long period of time. He put in a, large, a lot of hard work getting to know these creatures and that particular habitat. And one day he came back to visit the site and it had been graded um, in preparation for development to become a hotel. When he became a professor later at University of California, Santa Cruz, he was talking to his other colleagues across the system and they all had very similar stories where very important habitats were disappearing from California due to development. So they put together a proposal for protected lands under the care of the University of California that researchers could use and students could use specifically for teaching, research and public service. In 1965, President Clark Kerr approved this proposal. And then later in 1970, then Governor Ronald Reagan wrote it into state law as part of the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. During this time, lots of things were happening at the federal level too. Um, you notice in this photo here, the gentleman in the center is President Nixon. He visited Santa Barbara after a pretty crucial oil spill in 1968. I know California was ahead of the curve in some social justice movements and um, maybe in the environmental movement too. And he could have been influenced by seeing a beautiful location like Santa Barbara and having, a economic, having an environmental disaster. Today, the UC Reserve System is 41 sites across California. Um, each campus besides the University of San Francisco has a group of reserves under their care. Um, and it's all across California, which is a biodiversity hotspot globally. There's so much diversity here and the plant communities are and uh, elevation and different trains. California is a very diverse place. 
Um, but that also means is that California has this resource at their fingertips. They have weather stations, the data being collected, scientists actively looking at natural resource management across the state. It also means that we have connections with other universities across the globe, other land holders, the park service, county, federal lands, tribal lands, and other educational institutions and research institutions. Um, so it's an incredible resource and it allows for some great work to be happen to, to happen. UC Santa Barbara administers seven reserves up north by Mono Lake and next to Yosemite is the Valentine Camp and the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory. Um, along the coast is the Kenneth Norris Rancho Marino Reserve. You'll recognize the name Ken Norris from the protagonist at the beginning of our story. Coal Oil Point is close to campus. Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve is hosted by Dr. Brooks. Santa Cruz Island is a collaboration with the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Cedric Reserve is owned by the UC Santa Barbara, the Landis, and that's where our story takes place today. Cedric Reserve was established in 1997, formally as a reserve under UC Santa Barbara. And that too was a grassroots movement of people self-organizing and raising money to be able to purchase this from the heirs. Um, so it's really interesting to see that political action happening um, in the 90s and it continues today. Cedric is about 6,000 acres or nine square miles. The closest town would be Los Olivos or Solvang. Uh, we're next to the Los Padres National Forest at the north end. Um, and there's lots of mountainous regions, a lot of elevation change and uh, hot in the summer, some low precipitation, a very Mediterranean climate. We have a field station that's properly equipped with lots of places for researchers to safely bring their equipment and hold classes. Our facilities are absolutely beautiful. This is the 1940s ranch house, family ranch house that's been converted into a dormitory, if you were to call it that. Um, we have a nice meeting place and great camping facilities. They converted the old art studio from the former owner into a classroom for students. But the important um, facility that I really wanna to talk to today is the Lecret Center. Uh, so we have an actual center for research that happens where we can coordinate all the research that's happened at Sedgwick and get that data and the information of the people who worked here and the publications and put them and have a record of all of that. One of the primary staff members who handles that is Kristen Zumdahl. Uh, she's a very patient and wonderful field researcher. She's quite savvy and she's really great with data and maps. So she will chase you down to get your data and your uh, site locations. Inside the Lucrets, this is what's been happening. In the past week, uh, a lot of researchers are actively researching on some of the projects that you'll hear about later. But it's a place for people to set up equipment, charge their stuff, have their coolers, have a place to work, have water and refrigeration and all the things that you need um, when you're working in the field and you're not working out of your car. It's quite a luxury. It's also a great place to make coffee, which is really what drives science. And Sedgwick land is a beautiful place. Um, this is a lot of oak woodland. There's three types of oaks on the reserve. Uh, we're in the foothills um, and there's coastal sage scrub and glass uh, grasslands. There's a lot of critters. When you have a protected space, the critters feel at home. Um, right now it's tarantula season where tarantulas are out looking for mates and crossing the roads. I just saw 10 on my walk the other night. Um, we also have camera traps collecting data about wildlife movements. Recently, we had um, two instances where we saw a fox and, I'm sorry, a coyote and a badger working together in two different locations on the reserve. We're not sure if it's the same individuals or not. And so if you recall, the mission of the natural reserve system is research, education, and public service. And this is how we meet those goals at Sedgwick. There's about over 40 active research projects per year at Sedgwick. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but kind of um, a sample of the anchor projects that have happened here. A long-term oak restoration project, which Frank Davis was uh, spearheaded in the 90s, is still continuing. We have lots of interesting soils and geology, especially by the serpentine areas and some fault lines. 
um, lots of interesting entomological work and microbial science. Um, we also have meteorology. Uh, so if you'll um, probably experienced in the last couple of weeks, the sundowner winds, which pick up in the evenings. It's when everything is crispy and dry and it's a hot sustained wind. So it, increase, it increases the chances of fire. So there are researchers, Leila Cavarlo and Charles Jones, for example, are trying to understand the behavior of those winds. Um, speaking of fire, with the prescribed fire research that we're doing, um, this is very relevant to state goals and to everyone's public interest about wildfire behavior and how to develop resilience to it. How does it actually work? And so the prescribed by fire, this prescribed burns, gives a chance to work on things in a controlled environment and also level leverage training opportunities for practitioners. For education, we had 400 undergraduates come through Sedgwick. Um, if you'll think back to your courses, whether you remember your lectures or your field trips, it's probably the field trips. Um, and that's the place that we provide for students to come out. Uh, the ecology and conservation course is a UC wide course where students get to spend 11 weeks traveling all over California to natural reserves and designing their own experiments. Um, we do service students from the UC system as well as the Cal State Community College, private colleges and tribal colleges. Um, so all of them, anyone is able to come out to Sedgwick if they have a class that's approved. Um, Nature Trek is another way that we bring students out at a younger age, K through 12. Um, it's a nonprofit association that provides the transportation and volunteers to bring students from schools out to natural areas, including Sedgwick. For the public service portion, uh, we do have the capacity to have public hikes and activities here. That's run by our docent program. Uh, so we have a number of volunteers who are very scientifically savvy. They understand how Sedgwick works. They understand that there's uh, research happening and it's not the same as a park. So they allow us to invite more people to use the reserve than we normally would have. Um, and so we offer public hikes and events including a public hike this Saturday, which just happens to coincide with a partial solar eclipse, a full moon hike happening later at the month, um, and a hike that which should happen through the springtime, which is a beautiful time to come out. Uh, we host workshops. We're uh, revitalizing our native plant nursery to do some restoration experiments. And we're also involved in other community projects like installing an alert wildfire tower, which is a donor funded project, which will allow us to put a pan tilt zoom camera on a tower on a high place in, um, on Sedgwick and look for fires and smokes, most like um, when they used to have fire towers where they were actually manned by people. And we're hoping that you can come out to visit us at Sedgwick sometime. Uh, we do have an event on Saturday, November 4th. If you're interested in buying tickets for a full dinner and night of dancing, please visit sedgwick.nrs.ucsb.edu. And with that, I would like to introduce tonight's speakers. Frank Davis is a distinguished professor emeritus of the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, where he taught landscape ecology and conservation planning. He mentored 24 PhD students, including Kylie Brand, along with 15 master students in geography and more than 20 master's groups projects at the Bren School. In his long career, Frank served as the director of both the Long-Term Ecological Research Network Office and the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Both of these initiatives are now major hubs for open access data, research synthesis, and collaboration. His record of public service includes 18 years as a trustee for the Nature Conservancy of California, six years as the trustee for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and currently serves as a board member for the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens and chair of the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology. Frank's involvement with Sedgwick Reserve began in the late 1980s. He served as Sedgwick's faculty director from 1990 to 2000 when he helped orchestrate Sedgwick's, Sedgwick's transition to the UCNRS. He now directs the LaCrette Center at Sedgwick Reserve where his goal is to promote research, to identify, investigate, and then help solve California's pressing environmental problems. Frank's current research is concerned with fire management in oak woodlands, 
and the effects of climate change in California forests and rangelands and satellite imagery sensing plant biodiversity. I will turn it over to Frank and then introduce Kaylee in the second part. Thank you, Heather. I assume you'll tell me if you're not hearing me or if anybody is not seeing this screen. I'm going to just really quickly dive into an overview of the prescribed fire research here in Sedgwick. This is what we're gonna do. A quick romp through California wildfire and prescribed fire trends. Some of the work we're planning and, and some of the recent work at Sedgwick on related to prescribed burning. Uh, some of the research projects associated with that effort. And then uh, Oak Fire Ecology Research will take a deeper dive into the work that Kylie is doing and then hopefully leave plenty of time for Q&A. I see, Bobby, you want me to speak closer to the mic, but I'm actually using AirPods. I could try to adjust my volume here if you want. Or I'll just talk a little louder. Let me know if you have a problem hearing me. Let me just start by this um, history of wildfire acreage in California from 1950 to 2021. This is CAL FIRE. And you can see uh, there's always been fire in the state. We've had an uptick over the last 20 years. The watershed year or the high water mark for the fires in California was in 2020 when we burned around 4.2 million acres in wildfires. Uh, this has been attributed to climate change, to changes in fuel and changes in human populations and human caused ignitions. I will add that also um, some people think that probably on average before 1800, over 4 million acres burned in California every year. So this may be uh, back to the future. Prescribed fire by comparison, which is our topic tonight, which is the in intentional or managed fire to achieve certain management objectives, is much smaller in acreage and coverage in California. It's around 125,000 acres per year. That's changing in part because the state is trying to address the wildfire problem by doing more deliberate fuel management and wildfire mitigation using prescribed burning. We have a new MOU with the Forest Service in the state of California looking to burn a million acres a year by 2025. That's ambitious. You can see that between CAL FIRE and the US Forest Service, that's about 70 to 80% of the prescribed fire acreage right now in California. That's the lower graph which shows you acres burned by uh, Forest Service in blue and CAL FIRE in green for the last several years. So this is a big and ambitious undertaking to increase the amount of prescribed burning in the state. Uh, this burning goes in a lot of different places and a lot of different ecosystems for a lot of different reasons. And so right now the preponderance of prescribed burns in California are occurring in the forested areas, particularly in the public uh, national forest lands, like this slide in the upper right, that happens to be the National Park Sequoia Kings Canyon, where they're burning for to mitigate severe wildfire risk and for ecological purposes. But there's also fires uh, down in the chaparral zone, like the lower right-hand corner there, where you see a prescribed burnout at Vandenberg Space Force Base in the Maritime Chaparral. Uh, cultural burns, tribal resources uh, that are encouraged by burning for like this black oak woodland in the upper left. And then, uh, yes, close to home and close to uh, tonight, last just a couple of weeks ago when we were burning grasslands on the North Campus open space uh, for ecological restoration purposes. So lots of reasons. If you put want to put Sedgwick in perspective in terms of wildfire and prescribed fire, Here's the Sedgwick Reserve is the yellow polygon. I just put the Dangerman Preserve, Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy down at Point Conception. Just again, to give you some context, you can see the Santa Barbara and Goleta and Isla Vista. Sedgwick's about 45 minutes to the north, 45 minute drive northwest of Santa Barbara. So the green areas in this map are public lands. There's also the Vandenberg Space Force Base in gray against the coast. The lighter areas are privately owned lands, and you can see that the private elevations here are mainly lower elevations. This is looking across Sedgwick just last week, across the Sedgwick Reserve up into those public lands, the Los Padres National Forest. You can see Figueroa Mountain up in the upper left corner of this photo. Our emphasis tonight is gonna to be on the foothill environments, the lower elevations that have the grasslands, the oak woodlands and oak uh, savannas, 
and the coastal sage scrub that you see in the foreground, which is purple sage, California sagebrush. These are the foothill environments of Sedgwick that we're going to be talking about prescribed burning in. Here's the wildfire history for our area. You can see the Sedgwick boundary outlined in yellow there in the middle there. And you can see uh, wildfires are certainly a part of our history. This goes back to 1900. The most recent fires are in orange and red. The wildfires tend to be big. They tend to be at higher elevations, a lot of them in chaparral and in montane forests. As you move down lower in our landscapes, you'll see a far less wildfire, and this tends to be smaller. These are in areas in those foothill environments where the fires have been uh, more readily contained. By comparison, here's the prescribed fire history since 1950 for our region. You can see there's not a lot of prescribed burning. Again, the colors are such that the orange colors are the most recent, just the last 10 years, and then the red in the last 10 to 20 years. And so less, less prescribed burning in our area, much more wildfire. Where the prescribed burns are occurring is quite deliberate, like the control burns out on Vandenberg, uh, along the San Rafael foothills. Much of this is Santa Barbara County. Even you'll see some prescribed burns there against Sedgwick boundary. And it's to, to specifically try to address the risk of wildfires spreading into rural, residential, and urban areas. So this map just shows you in purple and in the rust color, the wildland urban interface and the wildland urban intermix zones in our area. This is a cool database that was produced by some folks at Wisconsin. It's using 125 million housing and building locations across the U.S. to map the wildland urban interface and intermix. And you can see Sedgwick here has this interface with some wildland urban intermix, and that's in fact the woodland subdivision, the woodland ranch, and here we're down in the southwest corner of Sedgwick, looking up across our boundary, up into Woodstock, the Woodstock uh, Ranch area, one of these interfaces between a nature reserve and rural residential housing. And of course, this is a place where the fire agencies are worried, uh, worried about the interface between the wildland and the possibility of wildfires and uh, rural residential development. So with that in mind, the Sedgwick Reserve has worked for a number of years now with Santa Barbara County Fire Department on something called a vegetation management plan, a VMP. And the VMP is a 10-year kind of programmatic permit that allows us to try to burn with prescribed burning on the reserve in order to mitigate wildfire risk in our area, both fire spreading into Sedgwick as well as fire spreading out of Sedgwick. The orange area is another VMP, the local Spalding Ranch in the Midland School, where the county has been burning. You may have heard on the radio that they're planning a burn next week at Midland. And then the green areas inside of Sedgwick are the areas that are part of our vegetation management plan, where we have the opportunity to do prescribed burnings with Santa Barbara County Fire Department. And then one last thing, there's some smaller blue and gray areas there. Those are areas that are training exchange, prescribed fire training exchange or TREX burns, where we're doing prescribed burns with the Nature Conservancy in order to do actual uh, training of people interested in careers in prescribed fire management. I think this kind of um, use of prescribed burns is not only a, a sort of a public safety, but for a reserve like us, it also gives us an opportunity to plan and execute uh, research in these foothill environments to understand the role of fire and particularly prescribed fire and the outcomes for stewardship, for public safety and so forth. This quote from a recent uh, task force report just points out that we need research in these environments. More research is needed to guide management activities where relatively little research has been completed. For example, the foothill and the valley ecosystem. So that's what we're up to. Here's an example of a grassland fire, Matthew Shapiro on the right-hand side measuring the rate of spread of fires in grasslands that are being treated, uh, subjected to different grazing treatments with Santa Barbara County firefighters watching as we go. Um, when you do prescribed burning, there are clearly objectives, and there are a number of different objectives, objectives for prescribed burning. It could be to improve range uh, for livestock. It could be to mitigate wildfire severity for public safety could be to improve biodiversity, game management, uh, plant diversity, animal diversity, could be to control invasive or nuisance species, 
cultural resources, tribal burning to actually promote uh, traditional resources uh, that are used by our Native American tribes in California. All of these could be different objectives. Our research at Cedric is asking, what is the kind of science that might inform uh, the kinds of burning you might do to meet those objectives? And so we're specifically doing research around fire, fuel behave, fuels and fire behavior, plant species and communities, how they respond to prescribed burning, wildlife responses, soils and hydrology, energy balance and weather. And then one of the interesting questions will be, to what extent can you meet mutual or multiple objectives with prescribed burning in a place like Sedgwick and in these foothill environments? This is an eye test, I apologize, but the point is to say you don't do this without a lot of collaboration and cooperation and partners. So uh, we have a, a really wonderful group of partners that are doing these prescribed burn projects with us from the county fire department first and foremost to the air pollution control district. TNC has been a great partner, the San Diego's Chumash Environmental Office, Midland School, Woodstock Ranch, Santa Barbara Fire Safe Council, Cal Poly, San Diego State, I could go on, but I ran out of room on the slide. And then you can't do this without funding. So just to really give a shout out to Linda Duttenhaver and her dad, Morton Lacretz, they've really supported not just the Lacretz Center, but our prescribed burning research out here. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation was mentioned by Heather, Cal Fire, the Marino Parent Single Step Fellowship funding to help get us some interns and uh, research assistants. NASA started a project here in their Fire Sense program. I'll say more about that. We've had help from the National Center for Air Airborne Laser Mapping to collect LIDAR data. And I have to say, although they're not funding us, we couldn't do it without them. The uh, UCSB NRS staff on campus and the Sedgwick staff like Liza, Angela, Heather, and uh, Sam, a whole bunch of people that you all know out here at Sedgwick make this possible. So what does it look like? Here's an example, upper left, uh, one of the catchments we burned last fall and on one of our Trex burns, uh, pre-burn on the upper left, the day of the burn after the burning had occurred on the lower left, drone images, you can just see kind of these are small units that were burning at relatively uh, mild conditions. And then that same area and just a few months later to show the resilience and the recovery of these uh, areas to prescribe burning, whether it's oak woodlands or whether it's coastal sage scrub and grasslands. So here we go, quick laundry list of the kind of research that we're actually doing here. And I hope you find this helpful. I'm putting the names of the researchers on the top so that if you're interested and you wanna know more, write down a name, get in touch with them or get, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with them. So we're studying the relationship between the fuels, their composition, their structure, their moisture content and how the fire behaves when you do a prescribed burn. So we're monitoring live fuel moisture in the blue oaks and in the coast live oaks and in the purple sage and in the California sagebrush. We're looking at fuel structures, uh, the good old fashioned way on the ground, but we're also looking at fuel structure using uh, remote sensing in particular laser remote sensing or LIDAR. Here's an example of a recent drone uh, LIDAR acquisition that Dan Souza from San Diego State collected. So one of our, on the lower right, some of our uh, burn units that are planned for burning in November. And then this little image just gives you an impression of the kind of information you can get about both topography and fuel structure from these LIDAR uh, data that you can collect by drone or by aircraft. Speaking of aircraft, NASA has uh, participated in some really exciting work where they're doing aircraft overflights, the red lines that you see here over Sedgwick and uh, the Midland School as well. And they're trying to test new technologies that will allow us to get a more synoptic view over larger areas of soil moisture, canopy water, active fire temperatures, and post-burn surface conditions in these burn areas. So they're looking at a bunch of prescribed burns across the Western US, and they are taking advantage of the Sedgwick and the Midland VMP burns and Trex burns and doing that. So the, they were just out of flying over Sedgwick last week, and they'll be out again next week. Another line of research is in the physical environment, uh, the physical environmental scientists. This is Charles Jones, Leila Carvalho, Gert John Dwin are in the geography department and they're interested in the weather associated with fire and in particular the sundowner conditions that were mentioned earlier. If you're out of Sedgwick these days, you might see this tall tire, tower up on the airstrip. This is a flux tower where they're actually measuring surface energy balance and carbon dioxide exchange as part of their trying to model the weather conditions in which these burns are occurring. Uh, also in the physical, kind of biophysical environment, Naomi Tag in the Bren School is modeling the relationship between vegetation, 
carbon uptake and um, plant growth, water use by the plants, and then fire, because when you burn these places, it changes, obviously, the amount of standing carbon, the rate of carbon recovery, and the water balance of these systems. She's using something called her, her model called Rhesus WM Fire to do that. Uh, we're not just looking at the physical environment. We're clearly also studying the animals and the plants. Hillary Young, Ashley Kerrigan, and others are thinking about uh, how things like reptiles and amphibians will respond to these prescribed burns in these foothill environments. They're using pieces of applied wood that you lay down on the ground. You lift up the plywood every couple of weeks or every month, and you see who's living under there, like this Gilbert skink here on the far right. We're also using wildlife camera traps. Pre, we monitor for we've been monitoring for months before these burns, and then we monitor after the burns as well. So the burn last fall, you can see before the burn, we had a wild pig on the upper left and some coyotes, and they look like a, a surveying crowd there, don't they? The three coyotes in the lower left. And then a month after the burn, you can see the bobcat coming through the burn area. And we're monitoring pre-burn for a fall coming up this fall where we've happened to pick up a mountain lion this summer. Then we're also doing plant species and community work, clearly a really important part of understanding the biodiversity uh, implications of doing prescribed burns in these areas at different times of year or different frequencies, how, how frequently you do them uh, between how often uh, the return interval and number of years. So grassland monitoring on the left, shrubland monitoring in the middle, oak woodland pre-burn monitoring on the right. Uh, because these are pretty local, one of the things we like to do is try to scale up from these local measurements using drones or using other kinds of satellite imagery. So I'll just finish my talk with this uh, image that you can see that Mark Mays took of a pre-burn uh, burn that we did last year. This is um, in the fall of 2022. And then here we are, the same area after the burn in the spring of 2023. And you can see that recovery. And so we're trying to understand how to use this kind of really detailed imagery to monitor the ecological outcomes associated with our prescribed burns. But to give you a little bit more detail about the kind of the what this research looks like and some real data, I'm going to turn it over to Kylie Brand, who's a PhD student at the Bren School and has been spending her PhD trying to understand the fire ecology of oak woodlands in these foothills. I'll stop sharing and now I'll turn it over to Kylie. I just want to take a moment to introduce Kylie. Um, Kylie Brand is a fifth year PhD candidate at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UCSB. Her research generally focuses on fire ecology of California oak woodlands and savannas. She's won a number of awards, including the Cal Fire Forest Health Research Program Grant and NSC, NSF Seed Grant for LIDAR data, the LaCretz Graduate Student Fellowship, and the UCSB Bren School Fellowship. Kylie hopes that her work will inform best practices for managing oak woodland forests and will encourage the increase of use of prescribed fire to improve ecological health and reduce the risk of destructive wildfire. Her postgraduate career goals are to teach fire ecology or landscape ecology, mentor students in their academic and postgraduate careers, and help expand the diversity of students and practitioners in the field. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, Heather. Just gonna share my screen. Okay, I think that's it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I've had the opportunity to conduct pretty much all of my PhD research out at Sedgwick. Um, and some of the first work that I've been working on has been looking into bark traits of the three most widespread oak species on the reserve. Um, so this is coast live oak, valley oak, and blue oak, um, and how these bark traits might affect the expected fire resistance of each species when exposed to fire. Um, so because bark is one of the first defenses that a tree has against fire damage, it's a good place to begin thinking about how fire resistant or resilient a species could be to fire. And so in the photo in the bottom right, um, there's two arrows, um, one showing the kind of darker outer bark layer, and then we've kind of peeled it back and the inner uh, lighter tissue is the cambium layer. So that's kind of like the first living tissue layer. Uh, and so when, um, when a, with greater, um, uh, with thicker bark, there's greater, uh, cambium protection. 
um, just presenting, uh, protecting it from damage. And then with greater cambium protection, this provides uh, better long-term health for the tree. Um, and this, I mean, so protection of the cambium and how bark traits affect that is an important research goal for understanding the longevity of oak species over time. And so that's kind of the first area of my work. And then the rest uh, is mostly focused on outcomes from prescribed fire uh, in these systems, um, but at more of a larger plot or landscape scale that Frank was talking about. And so to kind of go into the bark traits uh, project, um, we, um, myself and an amazing team, uh, have uh, conducted he bark heating experiments. So uh, these were experiments on live trees in the field. Um, we measured 31 trees in the spring and 38 in the late summer, early fall, um, and sampled from all three species. So the bark traits we were looking to measure were bark thickness, uh, moisture content, density, and time to cambium kill. So time to cambium kill is a useful metric of a tree's vulnerability to heat-induced damage. So it's the time it takes for the inner cambium tissue to reach a lethal temperature threshold of 60 degrees Celsius, um, kind of a typical cutoff for plant tissues when they start to die. Um, and so uh, we would heat, uh, and this is when, when the external surface is being constantly exposed to heat. So um, so we would heat the bark of trees for up to 10 or 15 minutes since flames of the typical surface fires in this region, they probably wouldn't stay in one location for longer than 10 to 15 minutes. So um, usually the, the flame kind of moves on at that point. So, uh, so the purpose of recording these times and measuring these traits is to build a model of fire resistance uh, for these oaks based on the species and the size of the tree, and then be able to make predictions based off of that of their fire resistance. And so um, in order to do this, uh, we wanted to essentially look at the heat transfer rate through the bark. And so first we would remove a circular bark sample. So this is shown in A in the diagram photo. Um, and that sample would be um, used to estimate moisture content and density. And then we also, so then we would take a uh, thermocouple sensor wires, which have like a, a sensing temperature tip. We would insert that into under the bark and up against that cambium layer at B. And then at C, we would attach another sensor on the outside. And then we would use a heat gun to heat that whole surface area and see how long it took for that inner B thermocouple to reach 60 degrees. So that would be its time to cambium kill. Um, and so most trees reach that time to cambium kill during the heating window, um, but some usually larger individuals wouldn't always reach it during the 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, so within that 10 to 15 minute window, we were kind of wondering uh, which species or individuals would reach time to cambium kill. Um, and so in the graph, um, individual trees are plotted as different colors based on their species. Um, so the QUAG is Quercus agrifolia, Coast Live Oak, then you have Q Do is blue oak and Q Lo is valley oak. Um, and so we tried to sample individuals across a range of size classes, but typically we would sample small or medium individuals so that there was a higher chance they would reach their time to cambium kill during the heating period. Um, and so the major takeaways from this graph are for one, um, the pattern of coast live oak individuals, uh, which are shown in the red, the red dots, um, the pattern kind of seems to be a little bit different for this species compared to the others. Um, you can kind of see that many of them are towards the left side of the graph. And if you were to kind of like run a line through the points, there's kind of a, the trajectory is a little bit different. So more work is needed to kind of figure out why we're seeing the species difference, but interesting. <laughs> and then the other major takeaway is that um, typically if they, if a tree reached the time to cambium kill, the diameter was less than 32 to 35 centimeters uh, diameter of trunk. So, um, uh, and this is shown by where the yellow arrow is um, on the graph here uh, for the size. So, um, in a way, this sort of suggests that those tr um, those trees that are larger than that typically have reached a safe size already. So they're large enough now or their bark thickness or whatever bark traits they have are, um, you know, prevent the cambium from being killed or damaged in fire. So they're a little bit probably more fire resilient, basically, um, but more work's needed to 
figure this out. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about more of the specifics on the work I've done with the um, mostly the Trex prescribed fires. Um, so um, in the field of fire science, some of the most important linkages, and I think Frank touched on this a bit too, but um, some of the most important linkages that need to be identified are how pre-fire conditions like your vegetation structure or density of fuels, how does that affect the fire behavior that you observe on the ground in real life? <laughs> and then how does that fire behavior affect the burn severity that you observe? And then finally, how does that burn severity lead or you know, cause certain post-fire recovery or you know, what are the longer term health outcomes? Um, and so if we don't understand these linkages, it makes it really difficult to predict fire effects and vegetative responses from fire. Um, so it's important to understand these so we can inform best management practices of implementing prescribed fire. So like what is the intensity that's best suited to this landscape? And this depends on the goal that we're trying to achieve. So which Frank explained or described some. Um, and it also just helps us best manage vegetation proactively. So if we can, since we can better predict the outcomes we'd expect to see and kind of plan ahead and move forward. So um, but prescribed fires are, um, as also Frank <laughs> kind of described, they're just a very rare and unique opportunity to study these linkages in a research capacity. Um, whereas with wildfires, you usually only have the chance to collect post-fire data. You don't really have, it's not planned, and you don't really get to have a before and after comparison, which really helps you make these links. Um, so the Trex burn this past November was the first opportunity for me to collect data on this. And my goal in doing so was to kind of quantify these linkages, record outcomes observed from a prescribed burn directly, and compare to predictions that we made based on preconditions. Um, so these are some more photos from the Trex burn last November, so last year. Um, and so the first component of those linkages I'll talk about is the fire intensity. So like the behavior, the intensity during the fire. So, um, so to measure this, typical metrics that are used are maximum temperatures, the rate of the flame spread or the flame residence time. Um, and for the second two, we're still trying to kind of parse apart what methods work best to measure this, but I can share some findings from the maximum temperatures that we recorded last year at the Trex burn. Um, so to record these temperatures, we use both a high-tech option, which was these data loggers and these thermocouple sensor wires, and then a low-tech option, <laughs> which was the pyrometers. Um, and so pyrometers are in the photo on the left. Um, they are metal tags painted with strips of temperature-sensitive paints. So each different color has a different threshold, where if the temperature reaches that threshold, that paint will melt. Um, and so it's a low cost method to estimate maximum temperatures across a broader area, um, since we only had so many data loggers to place out in our plots. And so on the right is a map of the six different plots that we had these really detailed measurements in. And so um, on certain trees, we would pair both methods, the pyrometers and the data loggers at different measurement heights to sort of capture a vertical gradient of what was happening temperature wise. Um, and we also put out pyrometers um, across the ground um, throughout the plots to kind of get a sense spatially in that direction. Um, and so uh, the three measurement heights were uh, the 1.37 meters, this is where diameter at breast height or DBH uh, is commonly measured in forestry studies where trunk size is usually measured. Um, and then at 50 centimeters, which is lower down and uh, more representative of typical flame heights we would expect. And then we put um, them also on the ground to get a sense of what was going on in the soil surface. And so, so for each data logger, it would produce a set of temperature curves like this graph. So um, just kind of a cool visual representation. Um, and this, and so the data logger uh, sensor wires were recording temperature every one second. So uh, this was one logger that was in the burn. So on the x-axis, we've got day and time. And on the y-axis, we've got the temperature. And so you kind of see this like fluctuation towards the bottom along, along the, x-axis. And so those fluctuations are like diurnal fluctuations. So day and night temperatures that you um, naturally would expect. And then you have this um, peak 
suddenly <laughs> something's going on. And um, this is definitely the moment that the fire is passing over the area where the state of logger, logger has been buried at the base of the tree. Um, yeah, so. Um, and so then we recorded all the maximum temperatures captured by each logger. And these are just four examples of these loggers. And um, in the map on the right, you can see which loggers are in which number. Numbers don't really matter. They're not as meaningful at this moment, but um, just there were two loggers per plot. Um, but just from these uh, four examples, you can see there's just a lot of variation across loggers. Um, and uh, so we have temperature on the x-axis and then for each of the measurement heights that I mentioned, they are plotted vertically for each logger. Um, there's zero chunk and zero away because there were two zero height or ground uh, recordings happening just to get a uh, greater sample size. Um, and so some of them were approaching up to 600 degrees Celsius, but Oftentimes, they often looked like logger number eight, so very, very minimum, very low temperatures overall across the across the heights. Um, yeah, so more work's needed to kind of parse apart what's happening here. Um, and then, um, so that was looking at intensity, but then to look at the after effects, so the burn severity and the recovery. So um, common uh, metrics for burn severity are. Um, maximum height of trunk scorching, which you can see in the photo on the right, um, kind of like how high does that charring or like change of the bark uh, material, how high does that get? And then also the percentage of the crown scorch, um, canopy or crown scorching. And so the bottom photo has, a, this is, was a very clear example where you could really tell the difference between scorched leaves and not scorched leaves. And um, yeah, most of those discolored leaves will eventually die and fall off the tree. They kind of lose their photosynthetic ability. So that's kind of an important metric for longer term. And then for recovery, we mostly looked at resprouting. Um, so uh, just number of resprouts and uh, kind of the extent of that so far. Um, um, yeah, and so the purpose of looking at both of these was um, to gosh, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, understanding just how the pre-burn conditions and intensity uh, lead, both lead to these outcomes that we see after the burn, both, both immediately and the springtime afterwards. Um, so first we'll go into burn severity. Um, so um, looking at this, again, there's a lot of variability here. Um, so looking at the average maximum heights of trunk scorch by plot. So these were averaged per plot. And so we have the one through six plots here. Um, uh, it happened to be that plots two and six had higher scorch heights, which was kind of interesting. Um, so this is, again, kind of representing such spatial variation. But when we looked at the percent of the crown scorch, there was a much more clear pattern where um, most of the time, there was no scorching at all of the canopy on, on these trees. And so um, a lot of this zero height um, column here, a couple trees had higher percentages of crown scorch, but most of the time it was none at all. And this outcome sort of represents the sort of, you know, often the ideal conditions of a prescribed burn where you're burning at low to moderate intensities so that very little canopies are actually being ignited in the process. Um, and this, to my understanding, this is typically the goal of many prescribed fires uh, to remove the understory material, but not be igniting the canopies in the process uh, because losing extensive canopy is often very stressful for tree health and longer term, like long longevity. And so uh, it's not usually the goal of land management here to have it be that extreme. Uh, and then for recovery results, uh, which were measured in the spring after, so I think that was about April after, the burn was in November and in April, um, we did see some resprouting in burned individuals, but very rarely. So out of 128, 128 total trees in all of the plots, there were only eight coast live oaks and <laughs> two blue oaks that had any resprouting. Um, Again, also very few were also charred, which seems to be sort of a prerequisite to um, kind of encourage resprouting. Um, but just, you know, uh, 
not very, not very much that we observed. And so um, there's two types of resprouting. There's epicormic, which is shown in the photo on the right. So this is typically uh, resprouting that's happening in the upper canopy uh, branches and regions of the tree. Um, or there's basal resprouting, which is from the base of the trunk. So it's usually uh, new sprouts come off the trunk of the tree right where the soil meets the trunk. Um, so, uh, but yeah, just uh, very, very limited, um, a bit more epicormic resprouting with the coast live oaks, but um, yeah. And so the major takeaways here, um, we did see um, in plots two and six, and this makes sense that these happened in the same places, <laughs> you have higher maximum temperatures and then you also have higher maximum heights of trunk scorch. So just a more intense burn in those areas. Um, but perhaps the more clear takeaway here <laughs> is that there's just very high spatial variation across plots um, and uh, across the, bur the burn, units in, uh, burn units in general. So, but this is likely due to the variation in ignition patterns by those on the Trex crews who were using drip torches to ignite the area and the fact that Trex burns are typically burned um, under or conducted under mild weather conditions. Um, other sources of variation are likely to be the fuel density, which we're still looking at that data, um, and other factors like slope and aspect, wind, there's so many things at play here. Um, and finally, there just was, um, I guess you could say, very little destruction in terms of the amount of trees that actually uh, died after this. So out of those same 128 trees, only six died. Um, so that's less than 5% of the total trees in those plots. Um, so, and this was usually like a tree that already is partially toppled over or part of its canopy is dropped to the ground. So, you know, it very easily catches the whole tree on fire. So pretty rare conditions for that. Um, and so for future work moving forward, um, we plan to measure the same pre, during, and post burn measurements in the upcoming treks this November, um, as well as other possible burn sites that Frank was mentioning. So the Midland School sites and the um, VMP burn units, which are um, next to the Trex 23 uh, units. Um, and I'm hoping to compare the outcomes across the different burns based on their being in different years, different areas of the reserve, um, and obviously very different fuel structures um, in each area. Um, and then finally, um, I hope to compare the post-burn outcomes for oak trees uh, that with predictions that we've made based on their bark traits and how fire resistant we expect them to be. Does that really match the post-burn outcome that we see? Um, so I'd like to acknowledge Kristen Zumdahl so much for her extensive work and help on all of these projects. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Angela, Liza, Nikki, and Heather for their consistent support at Sedgwick. Um, it's a wonderful community to be a part of when I'm out there. Um, also, Evie Vermeer, Marion Walker, and so many others um, that have helped with many, many days of fieldwork over the years. Um, funding for this, as Frank's touched on a bit too, but um, so generously from the LaCretz Research Center, but also a grant from CAL FIRE's Forest Health Research Program. Um, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers. That was very informative. It was good to see the, the high level and then the detail and how much complexity there is to take on this project. And we do have a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, I believe we have until eight o'clock, so I'm going to try to get through some of these. I'll address both of you, see who wants to pick it up. Um, the first question um, is do we have any information on the positive effects of fire when it comes to infestations of insects that attack oak trees like the gold spotted oak, oak borer? I can take that if you want, Kylie. Um, yeah, so there are a number of these uh, G sob or gold spotted oak borer is an invasive beetle that's attacking coast live oaks, especially in Southern California. It's a for those of you who don't know, it's a beetle that's native to Arizona, but it was introduced into Southern California, probably through firewood. The major effect of GSOB is that it's killing the live oaks and it's creating more standing fuel and probably increasing wildfire severity in GSOB affected areas. I have not seen really good links between the um, 
fire recurrence in these systems and how that affects the population dynamics of the gold spotted oak borer. I think it's a really interesting question. And other uh, sort of pests and pathogens like the sudden oak, that same question. There's a big change in fuels, big change in fire behavior in these affected areas. The long-term effects on the pathogen are um, kind of ongoing research, I would say, particularly for GSOB. Great. It's an important question. Um, the next group of questions were concerning the grasses um, that we have in the area. In the prescribed fire, are there native or non-natives? And have you noticed any native species coming back after prescribed fires? You want to take that, Frank? <laughs> sure, I can, I'm happy to. Um, so the interesting thing, and of course, we have we only have a limited number of uh, burns that we've studied so far. So every year, the outcomes of the fire will depend on the not just the fire, but the uh, weather of the following growing season. We had a this last fall, we had a, a relatively modest, moderate burn with a really wet winter. What we found was um, both an uh, increase in diversity, particularly in the hotter parts of the burn of native plants, uh, native fire following annuals and native perennial grasses did really well in some of the hot areas. Uh, we also had uh, really good um, Amsinkia blooms or fiddle neck blooms uh, in the oak understories, but we also had uh, a great <laughs> flush of in invasive grasses, the avena and the bromes and so forth, because we had a lot of water and it was so well distributed across the growing season that there was plenty of opportunity for those grasses to get big and dominant by the end of the season. So we saw both an increase in native diversity in the burn areas, but also plenty of uh, invasive grass growth in the understory. There, there were, the grasses were already there, but they did well this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a related question, um, European grasses dominate the grasslands now, but maybe not 30 years ago or earlier. Um, do we know anything about those effects of wildfire then versus now, given that difference? Uh, yeah, we could have a really long discussion about that one. It's a really important question, <laughs> and uh, the history is a little bit sketchy. Uh, we just have really thin evidence to go on. I, I, a couple thoughts. One, um, in general, when you increase fire frequency, you tend to promote the herbs in the system, both the annuals as well as the perennial grasses and the annual grasses. And historically, uh, pre uh, Pre-European California, there's a thought that tribal burning was quite frequent in these foothill systems. It probably promoted more of the herb species and the grass species um, compared to the shrubs and the trees. When you take the fire away, these systems tend to get woodier. So, so my sense is that the, the native grasses are relatively resilient to fire. They re-sprout vigorously after these fires, particularly low severity fires. Uh, probably, though, the um, one of the effects of the introduced annual grasses is there's more continuous grass cover across a lot of these areas. That's a flashy fuel that tends to promote more readily ignitions of wildfires and ignitions of fires, lightning fires as well, unintentional fires in these systems. The grasses, the in introduced grasses, probably make them flashier systems, is what I would sus suspect. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's so many interesting questions here. I think that um, we have more time. Andy, will we be cut off at right at eight o'clock or can we make make some more time, maybe 10 minutes for more questions if we all agree? Uh, you know, I don't actually know the answer to that. So okay. why don't you go? And uh, if everything goes blank, then I hope that we'll see you all back next Wednesday night at seven. <laughs> This is the first one we're doing. Okay, so here's another really great question. We're talking about the heavy rains. So with the heavy rain that we had, what considerations have been used when evaluating recovery of these areas? Uh, Kylie, I'll go ahead and you know, jump in anytime and interrupt me. But uh, one of the things I've been interested in is uh, when you do wildfires as well as prescribed fires, you can expose a lot of soil. When you get a heavy rain season like this, to what extent are you promoting a lot of erosion, a lot of soil movement, and so forth that could affect the recovery? I was really interested that in this prescribed burning we did last year, uh, we put a pretty light touch on the fuel breaks. The fires were relatively moderate, and there was 
literally almost none, if any, detectable erosion from those heavy rains. So the first good news was our soils were conserved in this in the post burn, even though it was a really wet, heavy rain winter in these burn areas. And then the second thing about the, the kind of heavy rains is just timing is everything as well. We had a distribution of rains through the season, so we had really extensive soil moisture well into the late spring, which led a lot of different species with different phenologies, different life histories express themselves over the course of the spring. So it was a really diverse and productive kind of post-fire recovery thanks to those rains. Oh, that's a really exciting discovery. And I know that they were concerned about soil erosion as part of getting approvals to do this burn. So that's an important uh, bit of data. Um, thinking about oak regeneration through seedlings, is there any data on the frequency or intensity burning that would allow for the successful establishment of seedlings? Um, and then a related question is the growth of the trees, that new sprouting that Kylie observed, the goal of the prescribed fire, or is that uh, an observation? Yeah, um, I think, Frank, you might be better to speak about seedling, uh, and I can talk about the resprouting. So two things about fires and, and oaks. One, the, some of the cultural burning has been uh, focused on uh, the uh, fires maybe removing some of the acorn pests, the, the weevils and so forth that might actually affect acorns because those weevils are spending part of their life on the ground. So depending on when the burn occurs relative to when the acorns drop, you might actually affect the viability of the acorn crop in terms of acorn pests. In terms of seedlings, once a seedling's established after a couple of years, my sense from the literature is that they can, with a reasonable root system, re-sprout after these fires. It'll burn the seedling back to the ground, but they're able to do uh, re-sprouting from the root system uh, in the seedling and the sapling stage uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to Kylie for the other part of it. Yeah, so um, I think the question <clears throat> was, uh, if the regrowth or new sprouting was a goal of the prescribed fire, just an observation. I think it wasn't a direct goal to have um, new sprouting. I think it was sort of an outcome that sometimes happens in fire settings. And so we, we wanted to check, is that happening here? And is it happening for these species? And is there a difference, you know, um, by size of the tree or by species? And so um, I wouldn't imagine that would often be a goal um, because, I mean, if the tree is still healthy without sprouts, it doesn't need to have sprouts to be healthy, <laughs> but um, it's a it's a response and a form of, you know, regrowth after, which is, is probably a good sign for, of its health, so. Oh, that's a great observation. Um, this next question is for Kylie too. I think this relates to the heterogeneity of your plots. Uh, was the growth denser under the two and six plot? That is a great question. <laughs> uh, I have not gotten to um, looking through that data yet, but that would be that would be the expectation. Um, usually, denser fuels would lead to a more intense uh, burn and you know more severe burn afterwards and uh, burn severity after. So um, that's kind of the linkages that we're trying to connect. And I think that that's something that I'm continuing to work on and hopefully we'll have an answer soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be continued. Uh, I got word that we can go until about 810. Uh, there's some really great questions and discussions here, but we will try to wrap it up shortly before theirs. Um, so the next question is leaf litter an important factor for fire in these ecosystems? I'm particularly thinking about deciduous versus evergreen contributions and the seasonal timing of that. Um, and then a related question is what time of year do you do these burns? Go ahead, Kyle. Um, Frank, do you wanna, <laughs> I can speak to it a bit, but. Sure. Okay, so um, I think the species matters in terms of leaf litter and that's the first thing. Second, leaf litter is an important fuel in these understory burns. It can accumulate to quite deep um, layers under live oaks, especially. And we actually are able to watch, in some of the cases, these live oak duff layers can develop pretty good flames, um, pretty good heat, and can even lead to canopy scorch in some conditions. I think it's for the deciduous oaks and the like the valley oak and the blue oak, it's not only that they're dropping their leaves, but also their leaves decompose faster. So it's a little bit of a 
um, a balance between leaf uh, production, leaf drop, and then leaf decomposition under these oaks. But the bottom line is, yes, that leaf layer is important, and we measure it as part of measuring the fuels uh, before these burns as the actual litter thickness and how much of it is the leaves. In terms of the season of burning, yes, it's extremely important for a lot of reasons, uh, for the, a lot of the species involved. The season of prescribed burning in our area is really kind of confined right now largely to the late fall. And that's a um, because you're out of the wildfire season, the crews are available to conduct the prescribed burns, and you've got the weather conditions that allow you to burn safely. Um, one of the things that would be interesting to, is to better understand the implications of burning in the spring, summer, or fall, but that's not something we're really able to do readily uh, here at Sedgwick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that timing is really important. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of good questions that remain. Um, I have this question here for Kylie. We won't torture you much longer. Uh, when conducting the cambium time to kill, were individuals sampled for each species at the same relative diameter or size? Um, I think they're referring to the scatter plot that you showed. Uh, did the Quercus agrifolia cluster at the bottom left have less time to cambium kill because it was smaller in size and presumably younger? Yeah, those are both great questions. Uh, yeah, so the goal was to, yes, uh, sample individuals of across the same ranges of sizes. So it was kind of a, a fair comparison between species that we have uh, similarly, uh, similar, I guess, diameters. Um, we also measured their bark thickness, which might change depending on the species, even at the same uh, diameter. Um, but we tried to kind of uh, get enough of a range for both. Um, and then... I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> um, it was the Quercus agrifolia that was clustered at the bottom left of your grab, uh, graph. Does it have less time to cambium kill because it was smaller and then maybe presumably younger? Or is that an yeah. effect of the species? Uh, yeah, so they, so um, that kind of cluster of smaller, uh, well, so they were smaller because they were, um, further to the left on the x-axis, so they have a smaller diameter. Um, and then they also have a small time to cambium kill. But I think what was happening with Coast Live Oak was as you got to a larger diameter, the time to cambium kill shot up so much that um, when we sampled them, they wouldn't reach that time during our 10 to 15 minute window. And so they wouldn't be really getting a value anymore. Um, they were like, you know, they're their cambium never died during the heating experiment. So they they more quickly, as you increase the size of that tree or that species, they kind of more quickly reach a safe size, I guess, is mm -hmm. kind of the idea. They're not getting, their cambium isn't dying in our, at least in our heating experiments. So that's why only the left ones are sort of showing up, I would guess. Yes, that's really interesting. Um, I'm gonna, one last question to Kylie, and I think we'll wrap it up after this. Um, so the intent of your research is applied and practical. Um, I'm wondering if your temperature data as the bark is heated might reveal a physiological adaptation in the oak tree's bark. Um, is the temperature increase linear or are there inflection points indicating, for example, a phase change in the water, which might slow the temperature increase in the cambium or perhaps any oils in the bark that might uh, spread and make some cool areas? Yeah, I think those are great points. Um, and I think that's something that we've, Frank and I have <laughs> talked a lot about in terms of like trying to understand or explain that heat transfer rate, because I think, you know, in any material, the contents of the material affect how the heat transfers. And if it is more of a linear pattern or if it shoots up really quickly and, you know, it does depend on water content and, you know, possibly different chemical contents, which we didn't measure. So, um, which we did measure moisture content. So that's something that we're trying to look into, but um, uh, I don't have a, a direct answer for like the, um, the linearity or not of how that pattern works, but uh, it tended to, let's see, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> uh, there was a little bit of a lag in the beginning and then it would start to heat up more quickly. And so it was almost, I guess, a little bit of a curve shape. Um, but as to why that was happening on a physiological level, I don't have as much information than moisture content density, but still, still working on it. So I think there's so much to explore there that other, other <laughs> uh, 
scientists can work on. So, but it's interesting. Yes. Having that um, looked at in a controlled environment, doing what you're doing is going to open up a lot of inquiry uh, to, to details like that. It's very cool. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Andy's going to wrap it up for us here. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for, for staying on. We had two great speakers tonight, so we went just a little long. Um, but uh, I, I think the question and answers were well worth the extra time that we spent. So I hope everybody enjoyed tonight's presentations and I encourage you all to come back next week uh, again, Wednesday at 7 p.m. when we'll be hearing from Madison Hurd about hearts in hot water, how a wet wind fish copes with increasing temperature and a changing diet. And Maddie will be uh, profiling her work done in the Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve, a place that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, so again, next Wednesday at seven, uh, the presentations tonight were recorded. Um, if you've noticed in the chat, we will post them to the UCSB NRS channel. Um, hopefully we'll get tonight's posted uh, by Friday. But if you uh, missed any of this talk, or if you'd like to hear any of the seminars from the past three seminar series, they are all there on the UCSB NRS YouTube channel. So with that, um, I will say good night on behalf of all the presenters, and I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.